Welcome to this little video on how to build and manage a PGJ competition team. Um, I would say that this is kind of, uh, you can take this as kind of a blueprint of uh, at least one one approach to how, how to how to do this. Um, and I would say uh, just really quickly, my background for this is that I've been teaching PGJ since white belt pretty much. Uh, since there were no one else to teach and I've also been in charge for uh, competition teams at uh, at pretty much all levels and all ages from probably around 10 years of age up until 60 60 something um, and I've been doing this for uh, 15 years intensely with competition and um, and now I train more to like a at a hobby level uh, so I don't actually manage competition team in the same way as I did for, for, for that many years. Um, I had a, an academy in Copenhagen with, um, at the height of it, we were around 700 members, uh, also other sports than, than jiu-jitsu, other martial arts, but the jiu-jitsu team was, was quite big and uh, at many competitions we had 40, 50 um, competitors. So we have probably done I don't even dare to count it, but uh, we have done hundreds and hundreds of competitions. Uh, so I've coached thousands of matches and I've taken many hundreds uh, of competitors through competition um, from beginner level all the way to black belt. So um, so that's my background for this video. And uh, I'll try to um, I'll try to talk a little bit about my philosophy of running a competition team, like my approach to it. And um, and I think I'm just going to run a lot of videos because I have a lot of videos from from competition trips uh, just to kind of get you in in the mood of, of how I like to do this. Um, and then I'll just talk over that. So um, I think the videos can can help to give you a little kind of sense of my approach to building uh, competition teams. Um, right. So first of all, um, I think running a competition team for for all levels is very much about experience design. I mean, one thing is the technical aspect of jujitsu, and you have to kind of uh, teach people jujitsu. But for me, it's always been about like designing the experience for for uh, for people who are involved in this, uh, who sign up for a competition team. Um, that is that has been like. 80 90 percent of the of the work and also i think of, of our success is um is to to design the right experience for for people and um and that's pretty much it and the rest the training part is is simple that's just literally just hard work uh it's boring in a sense the training part um but i think the real kind of value magic uh, is in experience design so that's that's what i've been what I've been focusing on uh, pretty much always when doing these uh, competition teams. Um, so I think one of the things that uh, a little bit of theory, I would say, is that one thing I, I truly believe is that humans, um, it's basic tribalism. Hum humans feel kind of comfort, comfort, and uh, if they can, they can join something that's larger than themselves, like a tribe. I mean, it's no different than joining uh, a fan club for a football team or something. Uh, I mean, it's it's um, it makes us feel if, if we feel like we're part of something, it makes us feel good. And even better if we can be part of something and then uh, feel like we accomplish something within that group. Uh, I mean, r race in the ranks or just accomplish like something that was difficult. Um, and I think... Um, that is something that we all enjoy and like. And through running a jiu-jitsu competition team, which it could be anything really, but uh, through running a competition team in jiu-jitsu, I think it's uh, it's possible to kind of build this this uh, this experience for people of uh, being part of something special and also of um, accomplishing things in there. And um, competing is, uh, is, is scary for, for people. Um, and um, and if you want people to to get a sense of accomplishment and and kind of progress and development, that happens outside of their comfort zone. Like if you if if they just train in the gym, it's just nothing like competing, you know, and, and being a competitor. 
Um, so creating a competition team is it's one way to kind of create a safe way for people to guide them to uh, go outside the comfort zone. And uh, if you can manage this and be a role model and give them the right tools, then you can kind of hold their hand and uh, help them uh, go outside of their comfort zone and uh, and feel like they're accomplishing something, which they are, like from in a personal from personal point of view. And that's kind of I think the my philosophy behind it is that I want to help people take them where uh, you know where they can't touch the bottom, in, where the, out in the deep waters. Um, and if I can create an environment where we can do that together and they feel comfortable about it, then um, that is highly valuable for them. Um, and you can say, <clears throat> if you ask why would you run a competition team? Because it's it's not for everyone. Competing is not for everyone. But I think, first of all, um, you have to define for yourself what ex- what is successful, what is success for a competition team. For some people, it's like it, they will say, you if you don't win at the black belt level IBJJF big competitions, then why, I mean, why are you even, why do you even think it could possibly be a success? Um, <clears throat> personally, I think that is uh, wrong in a sense because I've experienced it otherwise. I think it's possible um, to be very successful even at beginner level um, because everyone kind of, everyone has their individual level. And when you run a competition team, it's uh, you have to find challenges in every single person. So for some people, the challenge is, can this person win a major competition in one year's training? If they're very talented, if they are like physically gifted or they come from a sports background or something, can this person win a big competition in one year? But you might have another student where the challenge is, can this person like just win one match in one year in 10 competitions? Is that possible? Or can this person even, you know, get to like uh, complete all the training and just compete? That could also be a challenge. And those challenges are, while the the public result, so to say, is is very different, then those challenges are in themselves equal. I think it's just a bit as big as of a challenge for me to take a, a child, a young teenager and make them really comfortable in their body physically and also mentally in terms of competing as it is to take someone who is highly gifted who trains every single day who is uh super physical who knows they did gymnastics or basketball or something and try to make them win a big competition on the outside the big competition win the medal from the europeans or whatever is more valuable but in reality, as a coach, I feel like those are two completely equal challenges. So I think that's very important to set for myself that what is um, what makes this a success? Like, what uh, what will be? What am I doing this for? And for me, it's always been to find the challenge in every person. For me, as a coach, where can I take these people realistically? Uh, this person realistically on at their individual level. It could be win a white belt competition. It could be win a black belt competition, right? Those are two very different things, but at an individual level, it's the same, same challenge. Um, What happens when you run a successful competition team is that you will create, it's a great way to create a core group of just extremely committed, like I call them like super members of your academy. Uh, These people will just train all the time. They will be very um, visually exposed to the rest of the members, they will they will have a lot of value as members of the academy, and also to yourself as training partner, um, and also to make you a better coach. And um, overall, the people you can get through a program like this will be like pure gold members. They will be worth twenty members each at least. I'm not talking about financially, which they also will because they will hang around. But um, in terms of inspiring others who don't compete or even just raise the overall level of the academy, the, these these people will be uh, very, very valuable. valuable. Um, and um, even for, yeah, as I said, those, the part of, maybe it's only 10% of your academy or even 5% who will be competing, but that, that small group will be a huge inspiration for uh, those who are not competing. Even, even those who want to, but maybe they just cannot or also those who do not want to, um, they still feel like they're part of something uh, as a group and they're part of the academy and then 
they have these people in the academy who they help every day to train as well um, and that is highly highly valuable um, so it's it's a great way to inspire and to create like a sense of of group of group of a uh, of tribe in a sense um, and also to just um, inc- improve the overall skill of the entire academy because the more competitors you have the better your other uh, members are going to be like no doubt about that so um so i mean we're we're not necessarily talking about making black belt world champions that could happen um but but it's about running a successful competition team by individual level and um lucky for us jiu-jitsu is divided in divisions and everyone can compete um even like white belt at the big big competitions can be extremely uh, challenging. Uh, and if you go to the big competitions like Europeans and compete in blue or purple belt, that is a very high level. Um, so so that's kind of thoughts about what I would do to, uh, or why I think it's it's valuable to, to run a competition team. And, um, and I think what keeps people, why they become so committed to training and to your academy is that you can you can use this as an engine to give them a high, high value of experiences. I would call it, I, I'm not sure if it's the right term, but I sometimes call it the time of my life experience because people say that was the best time I had. Like I had the best time when we went to this and this competition. And these experiences are possible to design for other people. Um, I feel like I have a lot of experience in this. And uh, I use the same theories uh, for uh, for jujitsu competition teams, really pretty much the exact same thing as as when I try to design uh, the experience of a large social event or a training camp or something. Um, and um, and I, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but but just briefly, um, you can. I, what I do is I try to create these experiences for people, and um, and the, the the elements that I feel like has to be included uh, seems to always be the same um first of all it must be kind of it must be a high contrast experience that's the first thing i would say um so high contrast means it's like traveling you know it's it's easier to get a very special memory out of being in a place that is completely different from your home Uh, it's kind of difficult to sit in your living room and say wow i had the best time of my life last week in my living room right um, there, it has to be a high contrast experience. So it has to be something that you're not doing in your everyday life, right? And uh, competitions through traveling is a great way of doing this because you you, you change the environment uh, drastically. Um, but even competition alone is is high contrast to everyday training or life. Uh, so that's that's kind of easy. But if you travel for competition to other countries or something together, that is uh, then you then you definitely have this. Um, Social group isolation is, is very important. Um, there is a lot of studies on when they try to put, when they plan on putting people on Mars or something or in space stations. Um, there's a lot of studies showing that if people are put in isolation for even just 24 hours, complete strangers, they will bond much quicker than if they're not in isolation. So if you take the same people, same 10 people, strangers, and you put them on a, on a desert island, uh, for a week, they will forge much th- stronger bonds than if you put them in a city and they also interact with other people. And because the more they have to learn how to survive together, then I, I, it's, it's a survival mechanism. If they, have to, if they have to struggle to help each other to survive and to be more successful, then they will forge stronger social bonds. So you can say in a sense that we're simulating that through jiu-jitsu competition, is that if we can put a group of people a social group of people in a difficult environment, then they will forge uh, stronger bonds. And a difficult environment could be competition, and it could also be uh, traveling. So you take the, this group away from their usual day-to-day life, you take them to another country for a weekend, and uh, that is uh, that will definitely forge uh, stronger social bonds. Um, the other thing is that there has to be hardship. If it's easy, then usually it won't be as memorable. And hardship is very easy with jiu-jitsu competition. You literally just train super hard and then compete. Um, it's, it's like uh, people, I guess, like um, people who've been going to war together or even, you know, people who fought like MMA together like, against each other. They usually become friends in a different way than if you're just friends from school. You know? um, 
and uh, and there has to be some kind of struggle or hardship. And the, the struggle and hardship can be just training and competing. Uh, it can also be that it is hardship to travel really far together to get to a competition, uh, cut way together and compete. Uh, it can also even be just to <laughs> to uh, to go out, like to have a party after the competition and then be really tired and then you travel home after it. The whole package of that is that is that it creates um, it creates um, an a sense of hardship in a in a social group, and uh, and that is highly valuable for for creating uh, like a time of my life experiences. I would say, um, and uh, accomplishment is a uh, is is obviously something that will help a lot. If you even if you have all this, but you go and everybody lose their first match, then you will not remember that as such an amazing trip together. Um, so there must be accomplishment, and this is uh, this is doable as a coach to put people in the right uh, divisions. So you kind of not maximize their chance of winning, but you make because there has to be hardship. If they just win super easy, it doesn't have any value either. Um, but you you have to put them in the exact right. Uh, place so that they will struggle but have a good chance of actually winning um, and then the the final thing is there has to be perception of expectation uh, so uh, I would have to put in some work to make sure that before this event is happening that we're, that we're kind of setting up as a time of my life experience uh, that there is a perception that this is going to be great you know? so if we don't talk about it at all before we leave like nobody mentions it, nobody's excited together, then I don't feel like we're maximizing what we get out of it. But if there is a kind of a, even just communication about the trip before and people kind of, you know, get excited together, that makes a huge difference for how it actually turns out. Because you have a perception that this is going to be great. So once you you leave and you you uh, you get on the train or plane or whatever in the car then everybody's excited right because we're we're in this together that this is going to be a great experience and um and to create if you can create these great experiences together in a group that is extremely valuable for uh, for for the group and also for, i mean for everything for training people want to train more i mean they they inspire other members and uh, it's generally a, an amazing thing to have in an academy. Um, so that's pretty much it. That is, I think, the theory behind why I like to do this and why I've done that for many years. Um, so that is, you can kind of boil that down to you give people a feeling of taking part in something special. That is, that is what I boil it down to. And if you could do that, then you can inspire people to train a lot and also ultimately be successful uh, on the mats. So to get to the actual practical part of, of launching this, of launching a competition team, I, I kind of have a routine that I've always been doing uh, that I have been uh, sort of say like uh, adjusting over the years and taking experience from just doing it for many, many seasons. Um, I always run competition teams seasonally. So um, it's always a season of competitions. It could be one year or it could be like six months or whatever but there's always like a season of smaller competitions practice and like usually a final goal so to say but the way i like to, to set this up is that um i i invite people for a kind of a no strings attached meeting for anyone interested and i make sure that uh, when i announce this to the members of the academy that everyone uh, know that they're welcome no matter their level or their level of ambition or their experience. I want anyone who has any uh, desire to, to compete or to even just to try and compete, I would like them to, to show up for that. At, at this meeting, um, first of all, I will set, uh, kind of tell everyone my expectations for their commitment. Uh, so I will let people know that everyone is welcome and uh, that there will be room for those who want to win a big competition, compete uh, at every competition, train every day, but also those who just want to be like mildly involved in the competition team, maybe do one competition, but kind of they want to be part of the team, but maybe they have, I don't know, job, family or whatever. So they can't just 
commit training to train every single day. Um, so I, I want to make sure that everyone feels like they can contribute in a sense. Um, and I mean, every person who you can involve in this will be valuable to the competition team. So um, what I will do from there on is kind of present a seasonal uh, competition calendar. So usually I've been I've been kind of I've been, before the meeting, I've been looking at what competitions exist, uh, which one could we potentially go to, um, which ones could we uh, would kind of fit a travel schedule or some, and then I will put them in a calendar and present that to people and say, these are the competitions that we try to go for, or at least those available to us. Um, and I will also prepare a training schedule. So we say, okay, I, I planned a competition training these and these days, potentially, um, and regular training or these and these days. Uh, just kind of have a weekly schedule of, of what I kind of imagine would be possible for training and for competitions. Um, and then I will do... Uh, like application forms, so to say. I mean, they're non-committing at all, but it kind of makes people feel like they're committing at least towards themselves. Um, so so just by them filling out a form and signing it, that gives them already a sense of feeling that they're signing up for something. And I feel like this is, this is very important. And what I put on it is just like name, belt, current weight. And then the most important for me here is to try and get a sense of how much do these does this person think they can do in terms of training and competition? It's not going to be realistic, usually not. I would say like 90% of it is completely unrealistic, but it's pretty good to just to just have an initial kind of contract in a sense uh, with that person because then you have a frame of reference for for having uh, kind of follow-ups and conversations with this person about what, what you feel like you can expect from them. So name, build, current weight, and then their realistic training volume, I would put the I would put the training schedule on that on that form, and they can kind of uh, circle what classes they think they could commit to, right? Um, and also, um, it kind of sets a personal responsibility level that I can I can check up on. So if someone circles every single class in the week, I will be it's easier for me afterwards to kind of tell them. Hey, why did you not show up for that one class? But if someone circles just one class of the entire week, I will not be as much like following up on them and and, and expecting. So it's, it's setting a level of expectation for each person on on the team, which makes it much easier for me as a coach because I can kind of on an individual level I can talk to to the to to the members of the team, and I know what I should expect from them right? at least from the beginning. Uh, I will do the same for the competition calendar. So I'll put um, I'll put the list of all the competitions and say circle the competitions that you think you can do, right? That you want to join. Um, this is of course um, important for me because then I can see how many people uh, of the team can do what competitions, and then I can make an actual plan of what competitions we're going to do. Um, I would also like people to write their strong and weak points of their game. Um, and be as honest as possible. This helps me a bit for game planning, for individual game planning later on, but it's kind of nice to know at least also what they think they're good at and what they think they're bad at, because that's not always what I kind of know from just rolling with them. Um, because sometimes I play a specific game and it exposes some parts of that game and then they can't play uh, their usual strong parts. So I need them to tell me what they think they're best at, and then I will kind of keep that in consideration when we plan their their kind of strategies for the competition. Um, an important one is also that I I uh, I will let them kind of uh, define their own level of ambition and expectation because that this can vary wildly. And remember, I, I invite everyone to join the meeting. Um, so I, I need to kind of know if there, if there are five people at the competition team, it's easy. Yeah, but if there's like 50 people who show up for the meeting, which happens uh, happen for me almost every year, then it's kind of nice to be able to categorize them as saying, okay, these are super ambitious and these just want to try it out, so to say. Um, so, so the levels I'll usually let them pick is like they want to participate just to help out. They want to compete to try it or they want to compete to win something or they want to go all in. Like, and... Um, and it's nice to have a mix of, of all of that, to be honest. Um, so I let them fill out the form, give it back to me. And um, and then I have some data, so to say, to, to get started. 
Um, and one thing that's very important for me at this meeting is to let people know that me as a coach, I must also compete. I will do everything that they do and hopefully more. <laughs> um, the thing is that uh, I will kind of say, you know, competing is scary for, for people. It's very scary if you haven't done it a lot. So what helps a lot is that if they can say, okay, at least this person will be there to hold my hand the entire way. And it's scary for them because they kind of put something on the line. You know, it's they risk losing in front of everyone. They risk um, not li feeling they don't live up to up to their belt level. You know, uh, the higher the belt uh, plus lack of ex competition experience, the more pressure. Um, so if I can say, okay, I am the coach, so I put everything on the line, and I'm going to do it with you, then it's going to be very inspiring for people. Uh, for the participants to say, okay, at least he's a black belt or brown belt or whatever, purple belt. He's the coach. So he he's an even higher status than me. He has even more to lose. And um, and he will also do it together with me. And that makes people feel much more comfortable in terms of competing. So every time I'm taking people to competition, uh, I have also competed myself as much as I could if I was not injured or something like that. But that is always the goal that I will do it with them. Uh, if I take some kind of a role of someone who will just sit on the sideline, only be the coach and not kind of do the, the work with them, I feel like that takes 50% of the motivation of everyone right away. Um, so the coach must compete, to be honest. And I think there is no no excuse for this, to be honest, because you can also compete at your own level. Um, so that's that's just something to do. And it's, it's much easier for people to be scared if they do it together with someone who has even more to lose. Right? Um, so that's an important uh, thing that I will always tell people at this initial meeting. Um, and that right away, I can feel like that gives all the participants some confidence that they say, okay, uh, I can do this too. Um, one thing that happens every time is that do not get excited if many people show up, because usually many, many people show up. Everybody wants the glory, but a few people can, can or want to do the work. Um, so I always expect 80% of the people who show up for that initial meeting to not actually end up being part of the competition team. Um, and that is that is how it is. They, they just bail early and I just got to prepare for that. That's completely normal. And I cannot uh, not blame myself for holding a bad meeting or something like that. But um, when I announced that that initial meeting, then everyone gets super excited. But the moment it comes to okay, let's get to work, then most people bail or they just, or they're just curious about it, which is also um, valuable for, for the club, so to say. And then um, once I have all that data and uh, then I take, take some time to kind of uh, look at it and set the training schedule. Uh, so now I know uh, who can train when, how many people feel like they can join what classes, and that makes it easier for me to set a training schedule that's going to be uh, more successful. Um, and also the competition calendar, obviously, like what I would usually want to do is have a season of smaller kind of practice competitions and, and make it very, very uh, clear to people that these competitions are for practice, not for, for trying to win. If we win, it's nice, but this is where we try out what we, what we train. Uh, and then ultimately end the season with a really big competition as the kind of the, the big target. Usually we would always just, always just go to the to the Europeans uh, in Portugal, uh, and then we would have like almost a, like eight nine months of practice competitions leading up to that. Um, so I set the training and the competition calendar, and then what I like to do is to give the team a name. So to say, so every year the the team has a has a team name. Um, and this is again, just building, uh, building that, that sense of belonging to something. Um, it's usually a funny name. It's like, I, I don't remember what we called, called the teams, but it was like team sandbaggers or something like that. No, just make a funny name for the team. Um, and this will kind of follow us through the whole, uh, the whole uh, season. And uh, it's also a fun little thing. And it feels people, it makes people feel like they're part of something. So once we have the initial meeting set up and I have all the data of everyone who wants to be part of it, um, then I will start to 
think about individual game plans and training schedules. And usually I, what I want to do is have like an individual meeting with each person who signed up for it for, for the competition team. Um, this helps a lot also in making them feel like uh, I take them serious regardless of, regardless of their level. So um, if someone who's a white belt uh, really want to be part of it, uh, they might feel a little bit intimidated that they are going to be on a competition team with brown belts or black belts. So, uh, so it's important for me to have like an individual talk with each person and, and kind of just talk through their what they put down on the on the application form, so, so to say. And um, and this, and here I kind of signal to them that even though you're a beginner, I will take it very seriously and I want to create a challenge that is as challenging for you as as uh, as it is for me to take a black belt uh, to a big competition. Um, and I try to make, um, I try to make game plans, individual game plans, but it's very individual um like if i can do that early or not some people it's super obvious what their game plan will be um because you see them roll and they just have something they're really good at or something they're really comfortable at maybe they have a body type or something that 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 uh just kind of fits one game uh and then i'm gonna early on talk to them about let's let's nurture this maybe there's like a wrestling style a guy would love to have uh, one person who would love to have like a wrestling style game i'll kind of nurture that maybe that someone has a really good guard they're really flexible uh we, we're gonna have to keep focus on like uh a guard heavy uh strategy um maybe someone has like let's say a judo background or something uh we're gonna obviously focus on on uh on more of a stand-up strategy for them so um, for some people, it's kind of obvious, but for some people, it takes a few competitions, to be honest. And 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 I will be very honest with this, at these individual meetings and just say, like, you know what? I actually don't know what you're really good at yet, um, but let's do two or three competitions and see what happens. Or is there something that works really well, something that doesn't work well? Because in competition, you people also act a role differently than in the gym. You know? uh, some people have a role completely uh, like 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 they train and some people are like night and day when you see them roll in the in the gym and then they go to a competition it's two completely different uh styles or or, or almost like two different persons so so um so this is some some people just need a few competitions to see what they're uh, i mean what 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 works for them um, and what I try to do is I try to build just when when I kind of get an idea of this, I will try to build a simple flowchart for them also. So we have um, like something visual on paper that we can talk about and look at together. And for some people, it's just like pull guard, go for this sweep and try to to pass or something. All right? For some people, it might be like pull guard foot luck or some people it might be more complicated. Uh, they might have a few things that they're really good at, some for top, for, some for bottom. It might be wrestling and guillotines or something. Um, but I tried to make a little flowchart. Of course, this is not final. We need to kind of evaluate that uh, over the over the course of the season. Um, but one thing that, that is really important for me as to build a team is to try to um, build experts. Like I want to build a team of specialists. Because if everyone has the exact same game on the entire team, then once you go to a competition, you might be exposed to someone who is doing something different. And uh, it might be very difficult for you to handle, or at least even more for beginners to handle that. Um, so what's really important for me when I have an entire team is that I try to make uh, specialists. And so I will optimally try to have, like, let's say one guy who's a really good, has like a lot of wrestling focus, one guy who has a really strong guillotine, one guy with a spider guard, like a lapel guard style game. Uh, I want a half guard guy. I want a leg lock expert. I want a triangle guy. Um, so this is also something I keep in mind when I make the game plans for people is that I try to, I try to, to, to create a wide uh, range of skill on the team. Uh, if I only have wrestlers with guillotine on the entire uh, team, then we're going to be in trouble if we run into someone with spider, like with a good spider guard, uh, open guard game in competition. Um, so I need to create these experts. And then as early on as possible, I try to nurture people to have a style that fits them and also something they find fun and interesting to, 
to train and practice and compete with, obviously. Um, and that's kind of w what I'm doing when I when I plan these uh, these game plans, individual game plans. We also talk a little bit about weight target. Um, obviously, this is also depends on how ambitious people are. If they're very ambitious, I'm gonna uh, and they maybe are overweight or something. I'm gonna put more pressure on them to reach a certain weight class. If they're not very ambitious, I would say compete at whatever weight you are that day. Uh, do not put pressure on your body like that. But but you have to kind of have a conversation about it. And and, um, and often you just kind of set, um, uh, you say if someone is just like a little bit overweight, then we say, okay, um, we just need to talk about weight cutting. So you can cut weight just close to the competition or you need to lose a little bit of weight over time or you need to gain weight and get closer to the to the limit of this weight class so you're not like in the middle of it. And this is obviously like a long term term thing over the entire season, but it's important to have that conversation and also keep track of it. Um, then also at the, this individual conversation, I will I will talk about like a training target. Um, what what classes that person has put on that they they will they expect to show up for, and what should I do if they do not show up? Um, obviously, this needs to be evaluated over the course of the season. Uh, some people, if they say they show up five days a week, they will always show up five days a week, no exceptions. And some people will say they come for 10 classes, but they after a few months, I, I will see them once a week. And then we need to have a conversation about that. But the most important is that we make kind of a, like a contract, so to say, not a real one, but we just have a conversation about it. And there is an expectation between us to say, okay, you will tell me you're going to train a lot. So if you do not show up, I expect that you have a good reason for it. Um, same with competitions, uh, what competitions that person expect to join, obviously things can change, you know, people's life can change. Um, and also I will talk to them about which competitions will be your practice competitions and which are to win. You know? So if they're very ambitious, we're going to have some practice competitions, but uh, over the course of the season, uh, some that they, we will really try to make them win at all costs. Um, if they're not very ambitious, we say, okay, it's all practice. It doesn't really matter. And, but usually we'll say for most people, it'll be a year of practice competition and then a big one that we aim to win, uh, which we, let's say the Europeans or something in this case. Um, and for some people that goal will just be to compete, you know, and that is totally fine. You know? And for some people it's like, I want to win a gold medal at a major competition. Um, and that is both are, are completely fine. And both are really interesting challenges for me as the coach. Um, what I will also do when when we start to build uh, these individual game plans, one thing that I found has helped me uh, tremendously is, uh, let's say one person's game plan is just to shoot double legs, right? He must be a uh, double leg beast and then maybe a few other things like, let's say, pressure passing or something um, or top holding top, whatever. So if this one person is is going to be the double leg expert, or let's say the guillotine expert, I have these two people, what I will do is I'm going to make them give them a side mission that in X amount of time, let's say six months, they have to attempt, uh, let's imagine 1000 guillotines or double legs in training. Yeah. Uh, so that is their individual side mission. And this gives them, uh, first of all, getting that individual very specific individual uh, attention from the coach is very valuable, I think. Uh, it makes them feel like they're being seen and that they have kind of a purpose in training and someone is keeping track of them. This is super important um, because it's very easy for people to feel uh, like not forgotten in a team, but maybe just invisible in a sense if they don't win or they don't compete at a high level. So this is a great way to give them an individual focus. Like, and let's say, I will say, you need to attempt 1,000 double legs in the course of six months or 1,000 guillotines. Just attempt. I don't care if you actually pull them off or not. Just attempt them. Yeah? Uh, so I'm going to make a post, uh, like a piece of paper on the wall with a grid with a thousand boxes and the name and say, um, this and this name, 1,000 uh, double legs, deadline this. And I'm going to post it on the wall of the gym very, very visually for everyone to see it. Um, both the other competitors, both themselves and the other competitors and everyone else in the gym, right? And that creates kind of a little side, 
side mission or something. It's something fun and everyone is involved in this one person's mission to do a thousand double legs. And whenever they pull off a double leg in training, everybody's cheering or they know that this person is practicing this so that they can try to win with that in competition and also give us all better sprawls. Um, and I'll obviously hang like a pen there and they have to, every training, they have to put an X on for every attempt they did. And uh, this is a wonderful thing, a uh, little tool that I've, I've I've loved to use, especially also at lower levels, um, because someone who's maybe a white belt and they they feel like, okay, I'm not going to be too ambitious about winning anything. You know, I might have family, career, whatever, uh, but I want to feel like part of this team. If I give them this little mission, even then, you know, everybody kind of follows them and they feel like they have a challenge, you know, a challenge that is similar to competing. They're just competing with themselves in a sense, but in a very public, um, public uh, setting, uh, they're they're very exposed to the to the whole to the whole team, and that is highly valuable. So I love to give these side missions, and this also helps create the experts that I talked about. Um, I'm gonna present all of this to each of them individual the the flow chart, the the training target, the weight target, the composition target, their side missions. I'm gonna write that on a nice piece of paper, and I'm gonna make them sign it. Like not that it's a real contract or anything, but just that we have a copy each that we sign, then we have an agreement. Me and this one person, no matter their level, this is our agreement between, it's a gentleman agreement between me and this person. And I can kind of, you know, follow up on it. So uh, now they know that they made this agreement with me. I'm going to go through all of this with them. I'm going to do all the training. I'm going to compete as well. And I, I will be there if if they say they're going to be there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I will be there every single day and wait for them. Right, That's our agreement. And if we need to adjust it later on, we do that. But at least we have something that makes them feel like they're part of something and that they committed to it. Mm -hmm. And this, this, I think this is this is a valuable. This is a good thing to do. And then when they each have a game plan, so to say, or a side mission or whatever, uh, then the, the mission is for this full season, they will just practice that, just target that thing. Uh, practice target study on their own as well. I will give them some technical input, but but obviously they need to um, to also put in some disciplined effort individually to, if, let's say you're gonna be the, the guillotine uh, expert on the team. This person also needs to seek out guillotine experts and watch instructionals and whatever. I cannot give them everything because I'm not that level of guillotine expert myself. You know, um, it's also highly valuable for me to make experts on a team that has one skill they're better at than myself. That is super valuable as, as a coach. Um, so let's say this person is going to be the guillotine expert. They need to do an entire season of just practicing, studying, and trying to do that in competition and just try to win with that. And at the end of the season, I mean, they may or may not win the big competition with that, but at least they had that one thing that they just focused on. And that will be a super valuable skill they can take with them for the rest of their jiu-jitsu career. So looking at the actual kind of main training routine, um, this is the simplest and easiest part of the whole thing is the actual training. And I think it's, once you start training jiu-jitsu as a sport, uh, then it becomes very simplified, so to say. Um, and I would say that, that we would have competition classes just for the competition team, but I would also expect people to, to join um, regular classes like with the non-competitors. Um, but their main training will probably be the competition classes. And those will be 90% at drills, competition, simulation, and just 10% like corrections, uh, technical corrections. And uh, this is pretty much like how sport is usually trained, just except for in jiu-jitsu somehow, it's just like, let's practice, let's try 10 different techniques and then roll. Um, but anyway, I, I will just briefly go through how I would, how I would run these classes, these competition classes, um, without too many details. And um, and uh, yeah, it's quite simple. So warm up will usually consist of grabbing a partner and visualizing your game plan. So, I mean, we could do like a gymnastics or whatever. I mean, move around a little bit, but generally I want people to just get to work when they come for the competition class. Um, because these are people who will be training a lot usually. Uh, so I don't need to do 
uh, 15, 20 minutes of, of warm up with them. I mean, they can do that on their own before the class starts. So just to kind of get moving, I would grab a partner and I would just let them kind of go through their entire uh, game plan, right? Just kind of do technique repetitions in a sense. Like let's say one person is doing takedown to pass, to mount to a choke or whatever, or one person pulling guard to a sweep or a submission or something. Um, and just kind of run through that like nice and easy five minutes that's a good little warm-up and these are people who train a lot they don't need you to do that if they need specific warm-ups they will show up 10 minutes before and do that on their own i mean they we need to get the most out of our time at the competition class um so the most important skills for competition i would say it's it's actually incredibly i, I would say very very simple uh, you need to be able to scramble for positions for three seconds. That is like pretty much how the entire rule system, uh, point system works, is that you need to hold or escape within three seconds of a, of a positional change. Um, that is a skill that you need to practice all the damn time. Um, then you need to have a good guard, top and bottom. That is uh, jujitsu. Again, uh, we don't need a lot of takedowns because it's not really uh, necessary in with this rule set usually, but we need to have a good guard if this is like IBJJF style points, obviously. And then you need to have competition skills, uh, which is completely separate from jiu-jitsu skills. So, um, so that's it pretty much. Um, scramble for positions, have a good guard and competition skills. Those are the main things. And then whatever little technical details on top of that, that's individual. And I will work with people individual to, to kind of, let's say one person is the triangle guy. I will talk a bit about like, <clears throat> corrections for the triangle or we'll talk a little bit bit about this and and look at when they have been competing uh what went wrong with the triangle that they were trying and kind of that's that's the corrections part and i'll use maybe 10 percent of the training time with that for each person but they will also do this at open mats and talk with their training partners and once you once you set people on a mission to to become really good at one thing they will be consumed with it usually and and it takes very little effort for me to teach them that but if I have one triangle guy on the team, I don't need to do a triangle class for the whole competition team. That's That will be a waste of time for the rest of them. Um, so basically scramble for positions for three seconds. That is absolute key for everything in jiu-jitsu competition. Have a really good guard, absolutely necessary, and then competition skills. Uh, there is one more thing that I do a little bit is to practice to score first, which is, uh, 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 is also important in, in jiu-jitsu competition, I would say, but um i don't put that much much focus on it but anyway the drills i will do which will take up 90 percent of the training time every single day they show up we will do this work um first one is uh is scramble for positions and it's really simple it's literally just uh you start in a set position usually in the beginning i would start people in the turtle or something or maybe uh just sitting back to back or something or even as later on when they get more comfortable i'm going to start them standing but in the beginning, just start them in turtle. That's really simple. And you say it's it's like a king of the hill training. And pretty much all the training is, is like a king of the hill style training. So the winner stays in, the loser go out. And the the way you can you can win in this drill is is to either pin the your partners back on the mat for three seconds or get the hooks in for three seconds. That's that's the only two things. So it's literally just kind of wrestling for jujitsu in a sense. Yeah. So you say one, two, three, go, and the person who can pin the other, the, uh, the person who first uh, get their uh, back pinned on the mat for three seconds or uh, get their back taken for three seconds with the hooks will lose. Yeah? And they will go to the back of the line and the next person gets in. And that's literally just all we do. And you can do that in the beginning. It's really tiring for people. You can go 10 minutes and they are exhausted. But with training, you can do this for an hour easily. And that is highly, highly valuable training for jujitsu, because imagine if you practice this a lot, um, if this is your main training, right? So you try to pin the other person's back on the mat um, and you try not to get your mat, uh, back pinned on the mat. You try to attack the back and get the hooks in and you try to not let the other person take your back. Right? And then you just fight for that and nothing else. right? Imagine if you get really good at that. What do you get good at? Like what, what, what skills do you acquire just by doing that? Let's say you get taken down. Your initial instinct will be to not uh, get your back on the mat. Yeah? And for the takedown to score points, they need your back on the mat. Yeah? So unfortunately for them, you just spent six months doing nothing but that three days a week for an hour. Yeah? 
And that is a skill, it's, it's a very rough and simple skill. It's pretty much just like wrestling in a sense. But if you have someone who's really good at that, they're absolutely horrible to take down. And the same if, if you get swept, once you get swept, you need to, uh, when you, once you get a sweep, you need to control the other person and put them uh, on the mat, flat on the mat for three seconds to get the, get the points. Yeah? So if you practice this a lot, then once you get swept, immediately your instinct is to not get your back on the mat, yeah? get back up. And if you get someone in a sweep or a takedown, your immediate instinct is to fight like hell to get the other person's back on the mat. Yeah? Um, if the back is is uh, if the back is exposed, then your immediate instinct is to go for the back and get the hooks for three seconds to get the points. And also, if someone attacks your back, your immediate instinct is to to not let them get in the hooks for three seconds. And that's literally just what you what you practice all the time. If you pass the guard, you need to pin the guy and control them for three seconds to get their points. And that is what this drill will will teach you. And the same here, if someone gets to like a side control top position, uh, this drill will teach you to defend uh, with everything you got for uh, three seconds to not lose. Yeah? So it's just a very, very extremely basic uh, skill that you can just set set the timer one hour, just go. Um, and uh, and if people get good at this and they get in good shape with this, it will be an absolute nightmare to sweep, to take down, um, to pass, to hold, uh, to take the back. It's an absolute nightmare when you put people through this drill. And when I did my, my kids competition class, this was literally all they did every training. Uh, just that. I never really taught them pretty much anything else but that. Um, and that is the most valuable skill I know in jujitsu. Um, so that's the one drill, back on the mat three seconds or take the back three seconds and you win. Yeah, And loser goes to the back of the round. And then you can add a few more things like if uh, you win three in a row, you can get to go out, so you get take a break, all these things. But that's the basic. And this will teach you real skills for competition, uh, real instincts that will be highly valuable. Um, and it'll also make it much easier for you to teach people, you know, if, if you teach someone a technique, let's say a sweep, a takedown or a position, it's way easier to teach them to actually finish it because they have the skill already of just holding, controlling, and also escaping, not getting held. Yeah? And then you can add in a little bit of technique here and there, like, like just adjustments. But 90% but of the training is just doing that. Obviously, you also need guard because with this rule set that we compete in, then guard is a, is a position that takes a lot of, um, uh, you need a high level guard to, to compete and be successful usually. Uh, you cannot compete at a higher level without having an extremely good guard. Um, so one drill I would do a lot is that um, I would just do very, very long guard rounds. Um, and the rounds will be just the same person. And there are two different rounds. One is the top person is passing. The bottom person is uh, is defending the pass. That's pretty much it. And this will, it is, you can do this for 15 minute rounds or half an hour rounds. Uh, 15 minutes bottom, 15 minutes top or even more. And this is very, very simple, but it also really helps people to develop strong guard defense. Um, because very often your guard defense will be based on your attacks. Like people just, you just teach people a lot of sweeps and submissions, and then they will somehow not get past because they keep attacking or they will kind of figure it out. But if you put them in a training situation where they have to, uh, they, they, they are forced to just work their defense and not uh, put the top person in a, in in a defensive situation, then that will sharpen their guard defense tremendously. Obviously, you can add a little bit of technical corrections here and there, but just doing these long rounds will make people really comfortable with defending their guard. And if you want to compete in jiu-jitsu, you must defend your guard. You must have a strong guard defense. There's no way around it. Um, so I'll just do those really long rounds. And, um, and this also simulates in competition if you run into someone who will... Uh, kind of cancel out your sweeps and submission game, then you have nothing left but your defense. And then you better have practiced that quite a lot if you want to survive. Otherwise, you get passed and pinned and then it's over. Um, so that's a very, very simple uh, uh, training to set up. You just say one person pass, the other person defend the pass. Done. And run really long rounds till you get people out in the super, like out of their comfort zone, they get really tired and they just kind of find find uh get in the zone of defending their guard because that's defending guard has to be instinctive and uh and even more in competition it has to 
Um, so that's an easy, easy drill to do. And then you can also do the other way around. You just say bottom person is attacking sweeps and submissions. Top person is just defending, like not getting swept and submitted. Again, stripping away your your um, stripping away your your attacks, your guard passing will expose your your core defense standing up in the guard right? or being on top in the guard. And uh, that's a very simple drill, and you can do that for a long time. And also physically, uh, that is a, just a great workout. Um, and then obviously normal guard rounds, just king of the hill style uh, winner pass or sweep. Obviously, you need you must must include a three second control rule to win. Otherwise, you're wasting your time for competition training. So sweep, submit, take the back, three seconds control, win, and that person will stay in. The other person go out and then you get a new partner. You can do that for an hour, easy. So already there, you have like a lot of training to do. Right? That, that is just like, if you do this two or three times a week or even more for one hour, um, that is plenty, plenty to do. There's no time to, to sit and try to explain five techniques every time. Yeah? This is just put in the work and actually just work, work, work and work hard and and, and practice basic skills. Yeah? Um, and this is highly valuable training for everyone. I mean, you will not have the opportunity in the same way to to kind of talk about like technical details uh, and like really try to teach people a lot. And very often when I do this, I'm like, ah, oh, I really want to teach people all this stuff I know. But in reality, that's not what they need to be good competitors. That not at all. What they need is to be really comfortable with scrambling and with guard. Right? That's what they need to be super, super good at. And obviously, um, you could also do kind of the same drill of score first. Um, so. So you can just say uh, you start standing or whatever. Yeah, start standing every time because that's where competition starts. And then the first person to score will win. Yeah, so it'd be submission, pass, takedown, or or uh, take the back. No, because if you score first in jiu-jitsu, you always have a big advantage. So that'll be another one. So you get three drills there that are plenty, plenty to just fill out a week, every week of training. Yeah? Just do that a lot and you will uh, build strong uh, competitors. And um, this alone is super, super high uh, uh, um, intensity physical training. These, these, especially the the the, the drill of um, not putting, getting your, uh, sorry, of of pinning the other person's back on the mat and taking the back, because it's literally just wrestling with a gi, or even you can do that no gi, obviously. Um, and the thing about jujitsu is it the jujitsu. It gives you the chance to be lazy. You can pull guard and you can be on bottom and you can do very little and you can be very lazy. If you take completely take the guard out of the game by doing this this drill, you cannot be lazy anymore. And this will create uh, like people who can roll very hard and scramble very hard, and which is stuff that you want uh, on your competition team. So that's very easy. That's all all we do. Um, drill number one back on the mat or take the back three seconds. That will help you to scramble for for points uh, and also just like help you with everything. And then do the guard rounds. One where the top person is only passing and the other one where the bottom person is only attacking. And those are the two, those are the main drills. And I just do that all the time. Um, and I believe honestly that you can do just that for a competition training and then be successful like and then people will if they already have individual missions of what they need to do um game plan wise then they will uh, seek out that that knowledge and and expertise themselves of course with your help but i mean this is this would be the this roughest um strategy i would have for for running a competition team now the last thing that you need to be good at, remember we talked about you need to be able to scramble for positions for three seconds. You need to have a good guard, uh, top and bottom, and then you need competition skills, right? So there's a lot to jiu-jitsu competition that, that has nothing to do with jiu-jitsu, so to say. Um, and this is something that you can learn just by competing a lot, but you can also uh, get a head start by um, by practicing this in the gym. And um, things that I would, I would let people work on is... Um, warm-up routine so um i think every person should have their own warm-up routine for for a competition if they don't have any then i will just uh, give them some input like what i'm doing a lot for for competitions it's kind of nice when you show up for a competition you know exactly what you do to warm up yeah and warm-up routine includes both the the physical kind of movement stretching whatever you do uh, running around shadow boxing um 
um, it could also be part of like what music you listen to when you warm up. This this is highly individual. Some people need to to listen to heavy metal. Some people need to just sit and relax and do nothing. Um, but every person individually has to find out what works for them. And um, and so I'll have like a little conversation with people, say, what do you like to do for warm up? What kind of mood do you like to get in? And then during all these, this season of practice competitions, people find out what works for them and what doesn't. And what works for me does not necessarily work for everyone on the team. Um, for kids teams, I would usually have like, um, we would do a warm up competition, to, uh, a warm up routine together at the, at the competition venue. Um, both because I made sure that all the kids were properly warm, warmed up. That's difficult if they just do it on their own. Uh, it also kind of enforces team spirit. Um, and it also, uh, there's also uh, an element of expo showing the other teams that we are professionals in a sense. If, if, every, if we have a big team who warm up together and we have like a very strict warm routine, um, then it looks like we know what we're doing, even though we might not. Um, but uh, that, that, that has like a little uh, psychological effect there. Um, so it's also about teaching people um, to stay warm at a competition, you know, like um, what clothes to bring, you know, because some people just bring like shorts and t-shirt, then they warm up and then 10 minutes later, they're cold again. Uh, so this is something to, um, to talk about, like let's say, what do you need to do after you've warmed up? How do you stay warm? And, and also, how long does it take for you to to cool down again because often you compete uh, you have one match and then you have to wait three hours yeah so so this is also something to simulate in in um to simulate in the gym like let's say uh, show up and do your warm-up routine and then sit around for 30 minutes watch something something or show up 30 minutes early do your warm-up routine and then go in and roll right away and see how your body reacts were you warm enough were you getting cold do we need to adjust something? Uh, so this this is valuable because you have plenty of time to practice this when you're uh, in the gym. Like you don't need to get this. Ex you don't need to fail at this first at the competition. Um, so you can practice that with people, and and, and um, it's kind of simple. And usually after after a few months or whatever, a few competitions, most people will know exactly what they should do to. Uh, so, so when they show up, they have a perfect routine of warming up, putting on the right clothes. Like, I mean, for me, I need this and this kind of music. I need this and this warm up. I know I'm going to stay warm for 45 minutes. So if my match is postponed, I will have to do another warm up in 30 minutes. And I need this and this closed. I, I need this hoodie to keep my head warm because I lose a lot of heat from my head. I need these shoes, these socks, all this stuff. Um, and this is just a highly valuable skill that will give you like an extra few percentage or even more advantage in the competition. Right? Uh, if you compete against someone who has no idea, no clue how to be properly warm and mentally ready before the match, then you have a huge advantage. Um, so that's a good example of something that is a competition skill, but it's not at all jujitsu related, so to say. Um, I will do competition simulations as often as possible, pretty much uh, a few times a week, um, if it's possible for, for the team. So, so all we do is that... Um, we just simulate competition because when you show up for for a competition, there's a lot of things like you get nervous, people are cheering. You need you need to do the warm up thing. Um, there is suddenly people watching when you're rolling. There is suddenly maybe you're used to rolling with music. Now there's no music. You know you have been cutting weight. You don't do that when you train. So I'll do competition simulation as often as possible to get people used to to this um, to being in this different environment of of uh, of rolling. Um, some people are natural competitors and some people freeze when they compete. But we have to, to kind of help everyone to be as optimally ready uh, when, as possible when, when they step on the competition map. So the warm-up routine is one thing. And if I do a competition simulation, I would say, okay, it's your responsibility, if, if we already practice this bit, it's your responsibility to be warm exactly for the time of your match. Um, and then all, all I do usually is I will sit people in a circle or around the like a square. We'll set, we'll set obviously the exact same uh, size of the competition mat as the actual competition that we're going to. Um, because one thing is rolling at an open mat and there's a lot of people and you roll around, you just move around. But another thing is in competition, you need to manage the space of the mat. Yes, because there is if you back up and you have the edge of the mat towards you, then your game changes. Yeah? 
then that is not maybe not the best time to pull guard. And if you want to shoot double eggs, you need to make sure that your opponent is in the right place of the mat. Yeah? Um, and you, you do that by literally just making that barrier in training all the time. So I'll make that barrier, that circle on the mat, and then I'll have people sit around it. Everyone sits around and everybody must engage in the in the training. They cannot just sit and talk or do something else. Yeah? I pick um, two people to compete, compete, quote unquote, because it's just a regular training day. You know, just maybe do this at the end of the training or maybe just one day is dedicated to competition uh, matches. Or we'll do that, so let's say every, remember we had like every Thursday was competition matches. An hour and a half of just competition matches, yeah? So I pick who is gonna compete against each other. Um, and then everyone sitting around, they must, I will say, okay, oops, sorry, dropped my pen. The right side of the mat, everyone who sits there needs to cheer for competitor A. The left side needs to cheer for competitor B, right? So before the match, they go and talk to their their team uh, who is on the side of the mat. They they kind of cheer them up and uh, like talk about what they should do and blah blah blah, just like any other competition. Get on the mat. I'll be the I'll be the referee, or someone else will be. And then one, two, three, go. And it's as close to competition simulation as we can. So we need everyone to sit around and coach and also cheer. Right? This is super important. If you never train with someone cheering and looking at you. Then you're gonna uh, you're in for a surprise when you go to a competition. Yeah? So you need to practice that a lot. And even in a in a, a home setting in the academy, you can you can simulate this and you can induce adrenaline in in the in people. They get nervous when everybody's suddenly watching because it's very different from just rolling at the end of the class for half an hour. Very different. Um, so I'll have everyone cheering and they must be coaching and try to make their uh, competitor win. Yeah? Um, obviously there's no music there I mean there's a referee and we set the time as close to the competition uh, match as possible let's say five six minutes or whatever um, and then they 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 go and then after the match we, I'm gonna evaluate the match with everyone uh, the whole team and say okay did you notice this and this uh, and think about this for the next match huh? I'm gonna give them a few uh, pointers each uh, each of the competitors but also this is also a way for for the for everyone else who sits around and watches the match to kind of um, get to see it from a comp uh, competition aspect because there's a lot of uh, rule stuff that you need to know when you're competing or right? you need to know the rule set like your back pocket and this is a good setting for teaching people that if you just sit them down and do like a rules course <laughs> go through the rule book uh, nobody's gonna remember anything so for each I will use these matches to say hey did you notice that when the match was reset, and let's say you went uh, you went out of bounds, I reset the match. When you went back in, you could have improved your position a little bit, like right? even though that's you're not supposed to. But let's say you had like a half guard or something, and then just improve that that under position a little bit, and you're gonna have an advantage when we reset. Yeah. Um, so these are little things like little kind of competition only tips that I will give in that setting because people remember it more when it's in a competition setting. And they will feel like they're competing, like really competing in, in this uh, in this this training setting. So, so that is that is extremely valuable, and it makes people nervous, and some people don't like it. But you just got to do it a lot, and the more you do it, then suddenly it becomes boring, and the cheering and the coaching part of it becomes kind of like uh, you know like routine. And when you get to there, then that is very good because then competition will be much easier to handle. I will still do it all the time. I will do it. Uh, depends on how much training time you have, obviously. I used to do it just once a week for an hour and a half, but, but I mean, sometimes if you have a small team, you don't have a lot of training time. Maybe it's once a month or something. You, you do competition simulation, but the more, the better. You know, as, as you do that, then that will make people more uh, comfortable with, uh, with the adrenaline aspect of competing, really. Yeah? Uh, so you can also include the warm-up routine in this. Uh, you can even include like a warm-up area so you can have people hang around in the warm-up area and then call them up when their match is in and then people cheering at their whole teams like say yeah let's go it's your turn now and all this stuff and this really helps tremendously for competing um i cannot stress that enough and if if you want to compete highly stressful environment but the only time you expose yourself to it is the actual competition then it will take a lot of competitions to get really comfortable with that um so that's the competition simulation, and I will do that uh, as much as possible. And there's another thing that 
another skill that is, needs to be to be nurtured, which is that one, as a coach, you need to practice to speak out really loud and clearly to the person you're coaching. Yeah, so I will sit on the sideline and I will practice in training to speak clearly and loudly so they can hear me. And actually just the, the tiny thing that will make a difference usually is I just hold my hands up to my mouth like a little, uh, you know, what do you say, like a little megaphone. Like Maybe you can hear the difference. But even just holding my hands up like that and kind of directing my voice to, to the person coaching is making a big difference. Yeah? And then at this competition simulation training, I will practice to speak clearly and coach and give clear, clear instructions. And also they will practice in the, in the match to listen, to pick up my voice. Everyone is cheering and they have to pick up my voice. After the match, we will have a little evaluation. I'll say, could you hear what I was saying? And um, and very often in the beginning, they, they didn't notice anything I said, even in training alone. It's not competition yet. It's just competition simulation. They will be so nervous that they could not hear anything I said. Right? So imagine if you take that person already to competition, that will be difficult for them. You cannot give them any pointers uh, and kind of pass on your experience to them in the match. Yeah. So so that that is uh, important to do and and it takes some practice and then with time they will be better at just picking out your voice uh in the training and obviously you also need to be a good coach to you know what to to say like what to give them the time and and all this stuff and and this you can also practice this in the competition simulation is that you always maybe you have you do it or you have someone else give them time so they know okay one minute has passed two minutes have passed you got 10 10 uh, 20 seconds left this is the score, and they need to practice to always know the time and the score when they're when they're competing. And um, you just do this. You practice listening. You practice speaking clearly. You practice giving them the time and the score so they know the entire match. Because a lot of, of these matches will be lost because they just don't know if they're ahead or behind. And they don't know if this. They lose track of time. They don't know if there's three minutes left or 10, 10 seconds left. People just not know when they're not used to competing. Um, so that is something to practice a lot to to help them to to keep track of time and uh, and the score during the match. And obviously I will do physical training as well. I will just involve someone. There's always someone in the gym who knows a lot about this. Um, so I will have them plan like physical training, uh, something, something routine. And they will know better than me. Um, I will also film practice and competitions uh, as much as possible for individual analysis. So I will film a, a sparring or even these, comp the best is to film the competition simulation because that's that that's what counts, so to say. I film the competition simulation and then together I will put that up and I will have people kind of uh, look through that and I will give them pointers through that because the moment after the, the simulation, that's I need to give them some very clear advice, but it's difficult for them to remember all that happened. Um, so we use that also for the corrections part of the training. Um, and especially every time there's a competition, then that is our chance to go compete and evaluate. So we go and compete and I make sure that people know this competition is not important. Uh, no competition is important. This is just to practice your individual game plans and to practice the warm up, to practice listening to me, to practice everything, the whole thing. And then we see how it goes and we film it and then we go back home and then we evaluate. I'm going to have individual conversations with people, but I'm also going to put up videos for everyone to watch. And then we watch it together and say, did you notice that this worked really well? This didn't work well. And did you notice in this situation, you could have maybe scored an advantage if you did this and this, or here you lost some points because this and this. Yeah. And then we just talk about that a little bit. Then we get back to work and then we try again. So it's compete, evaluate, repeat all the time. And that goes for the entire season. And it's very important for me to get in people's minds that these competitions are stepping stones, right? Because often people will say, oh, the, this is the first competition. I'm so nervous. I train so hard. If I don't win, it's going to be a failure, right? But I will set people to say, you will very likely not win. Uh, if you do, it's great. But actually, it's better to lose because then we have something to fix. If everything works, if everything works, then it, it, we kind of, I put you in the wrong division, uh, in a sense, because then we have nothing to go home and work on, you know? Every competition needs to be uh, give us some data to work on, um, and that's literally the training routine. It's just just that you know, just these simple simple drills: competition, simulation, physical training, and then evaluation all the time. And that is the that is what we do for an entire season. 
So over the course of the season, I will also do individual ev evaluation. Obviously, we're gonna every time people compete, or even every time they we do competition simulation, we're gonna evaluate. And there's a short evaluation the moment after the competition simulation match. Uh, usually, they'll get like three or four matches in one one training day of training, which is not a lot of mat time, but it's highly it's pure gold. So. Uh, I will take that any time over an open mat for two hours where they're a little bit lazy and sit around and talk and they don't have any adrenaline going on. Um, and then during the season, usually a few times, I will sit down with them individually and evaluate. And um, and we'll just kind of look at, okay, so you told me you uh, would be training these and these days. How is this going? Like, And some people will be sticking to what they promised and, and some people will not. And then we just kind of evaluate their their kind of their sign up form for the for the team. And also to adjust and say, hey, uh, you said you were going to do these competitions. Is this still relevant? Because suddenly maybe half the team changed their plans or something or whatever. You know, they, there was something school, study, family, something, and they, they can't go. It's nice for you to know so that you can adjust the competition calendar if needed. Yeah? Um, and also the game plan, obviously say, how is this going for you? Like Because it's... In the beginning, it's often a little bit of a wild guess. I mean, you're going to be the guillotine guy, but what if they never manage to pull off a guillotine in the first six months? Maybe we need to adjust something. You know? um, this is, of course, also a matter of skill for me as a coach. Like, how good am I at reading this person's game and what they should work on? You know? And, of course, the adjusting the level of ambition is very often uh, necessary. Quite many people say, I want to be world champion. This is all I live for. And then two months later, they did not show up for more than three classes. And you might have to say, okay, how about we downgrade you to you're being kind of helping the team with training, but you're probably not going to do more than one competition. Also, just so you constantly have an up to date. And also people get can quickly get a little bit embarrassed if they say that I want to do this and this, and then they don't live up to it. And this is where it's important as a coach to step in and say, hey, it's okay. It's This is completely normal. Let's just evaluate. We 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 adjust our expectations and then we take it from there and then you're still a valuable part of the team because if you if you shame them uh, then you're going to first of all you're going to have to shame a lot of people because it's very normal to to say one thing do another thing um, but you're also probably going to lose them and then you lose the the value of uh, they can add to the competition team every person who wants to be involved is going to add value to the competition team so you just need to adjust the level of ambition with them Another thing that that's um, there, there are some other like secondary skills to pass on. Uh, one is the physical training that we just involved. I think it's it's a good idea to involve a physical trainer if you're not one yourself, uh, so you don't just guess and do random shit. Um, also, nutritional advice before and during competition is very important. I mean, if you read, uh, if you eat the right things, you can improve your your chances of success quite tremendously. Um, this is also something that you need to practice in just competitions over the seasons. Like, what? how does this uh, diet work for me? And weight cutting, am I cutting too much, too little, all that stuff. Um, and also what to eat during the competition day. Because if people don't know, they're, they're not used to competing, they don't know that they should maybe bring food. And then they sit around and wait 10 hours for a match, and then they're completely uh, out of energy, right? So this is also something you as a coach or or as a seasoned competitor can tell them, okay, maybe this is a good thing to bring this and this and this. So you have some energy, energy, proper energy during the day if you have to wait for a long time. Because you cannot just show up and expect there to be actual real good food for you to eat there. Maybe it's just acai balls the entire day and nobody can compete on, on just eating ice cream. Um, so that's, that's a secondary skill. Um, also weight cutting, uh, you definitely need to talk to someone who knows something about that so you don't put people in a dangerous situation. Um, don't pressure people too much, obviously. I, and I think this is something that you have to study and do properly. Um, I don't ever advocate that people cut a lot of weight. Uh, some people like it, they enjoy it, then they enjoy the struggle of that. Uh, I don't advocate it, but I like to people to kind of hit their target weight over the course of the season and then they only have to cut very little to just reach the the competition weight and if you're just a little bit a little bit overweight often it's just a matter of eating light the day before uh sleeping with a hoodie on and then you're good to go the next day or even uh, a simple water loading routine could could help a little bit uh, just to to shed some water on the day of the competition 
but this is something that's important to teach people about and also to practice and i would also practice this um during out of competition so let's say okay next week on wednesday you try to do a weight cut before you show up for training and then we check your weight um so those are some extra little skills to to include when it gets to the competition day i think there's a a few things that i i like to do in a, in a certain way um i always try to make people travel together to the competition even if it's a local competition I think it's kind of nice that they say, okay, at, at least let's meet up there in like this train station or whatever, and then we go there together. Uh, or if let's say everybody's driving there on their own, let's say, okay, we meet this time uh, just next door or something, and then this is then we we kind of walk to the competition together or something. Uh, this definitely gives people a sense of again being part of something. Um, and I think this is a very small thing to do that, that can make a big difference for making people feel comf confident. Remember, even though if you're very confident about, about competing, they may very well not be. Um, so that's a small thing that can make a, a difference for, for everyone. Um, consider the alternative that everybody show up on their own time, like the, over the course of the entire day, people come dropping in like in the afternoon some have been there all day it's just different if you want to build if you want to give which is the fundamental thing if you want to give people um the sense of being part of something then it, it'll be more i think more valuable if everybody go there together yeah? i always try to make like team t-shirts uh even put that funny team name on the geese you know that, that i make embroidered geese often i'll make i i made for the for the um, for the competition team, I even made like custom geese with people's name on, um, and this is a, uh, this is all something that makes people feel like they're part of something. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> everybody should support each other. Obviously, this comes very natural if you've done your your homework, so to say. If you prepared the the whole project properly, then it should be very natural for everyone to support each other, coach each other, and and kind of help out no matter the level. Yeah, and everybody's cheering for each other because the black belt might be fighting against uh, like a super hardcore competitor but then you also have a white belt who is fighting against his own fear of competing and they're both uh, something that the whole team can kind of cheer cheer on yeah? um <clears throat> competition is what it is you win or you lose then you take that data home to the, to work with um but after the competition what i think is really important is that you get everyone together and have a dinner together or something or even go out uh, especially if you're traveling um, this is very, very good for the team spirit, so to say, and also um, for people to feel like uh, this is like a full package thing. You know, again, consider the alternative. Everybody show up like random times. One person come in the afternoon, gets on the mat, loses, goes home. Yeah, it's a very that's a very different um, kind of what do you say. It gives very little value to the whole team experience of going to a competition, and you don't go to competition many times in a year. So, so it's it's kind of important that that you try to to use that opportunity for for something really good yeah? uh, as much as possible. Um, other things I would I would say that are that are, or say like team management or motivation, so to say, is that you can do like a Facebook group for team communication. That's very important. It could be any kind of platform where you can always communicate um this is very good for keeping everyone in the mix so to say of what's happening maybe someone get, are out for a few days they miss a few trains they can still kind of feel like they're part of it and you can joke around and people can get excited uh, remember for i think one of the important aspects of a time of your life experience is that there is there is expectation of uh, of excitement that that um sorry perception of expectation so that people especially when there's a competition or something coming up everybody can talk about it and they can get excited together and that will definitely give them a better uh i think that's going to make the whole experience of going to a competition together even better um other thing that i that is very important is obviously personal attention for everyone individually I, it's very important that no matter the level of what people are competing at that everyone gets an equal level of personal attention so i will have these individual evaluations i would just talk to people about it and then everyone should feel like they're part of the team because it's very easy to lose someone if they feel like oh i'm just a beginner white belt i don't have a chance to win anything anyway so the coach doesn't care about me um but you need this person 
to help with the team and also you, you, who knows what where they're going to end up i mean everybody starts as a beginner white belt they might end up as a as a high level black belt one day or a really good training partner for you or uh, so that's very important to give everyone equal amount of attention um <clears throat> there's also one very important thing is that is that i will i will put some effort into social elements that happens outside of training and competition take everyone out for uh, team dinners even like i don't know go out for maybe not too close to the competition uh, go out and have a party or i don't know go to the movies together or something or um, host a dinner at your place or someone else from the team and this all these little social things are are super or just go to the beach together or something um all these social things add to the whole um experience of people feeling they they want to to be to to really um contribute to to the team as a whole and in the end it gives you better jujitsu uh players it gives you better training better experiences uh, more fun memories and it's better for your your entire team and, and even for your business um also, it's kind of nice, you know, to use a competition team as a way to do something fun with your friends. And that's extremely important. And we did that a lot. And I, I totally see the value in, in doing that as much as possible. Um, I will also try to expose the the team towards the rest of the academy, to those not competing, and also to the public. You know, um, so I will try to, I, as I said, I would make like custom competition team geese with their names on. I would always make a team photo just before we go to that final big competition. We would have like this year's, uh, let's say European Championships team, you know, um, make that team photo, put that on the wall in the gym. And this will inspire both those who are part of the team and also who are not. You know? And even those who are not competing, they will feel like, oh, that's pretty cool. We have this team going every year. And I help them in a sense because we train together in the regular class. Um, so so that's 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 important i think to do that um and um and also as we talked about the individual attention is that i want to make everyone feel like they're contributing to the team i mean i know i said that a few times but this is super important and sometimes you can tell some people may be part of this competition team and you can tell they don't feel like they have anything to to contribute with and i will take them out like and sit down with them and have a conversation and say hey you are actually super valuable i really need you even though you maybe don't feel you are but <clears throat> even just that you are practicing uh let's say a guillotine against everyone this will help everyone to become better at defending guillotines i don't, I don't care if you're going to do it in competition or not but it will help everyone and then just give them a sense that they're also valuable and uh, every single person has the potential to become an amazing uh member of your of your team and your club so you should give them as much uh, attention as you can um Another thing I do a lot is that I will do highlight videos from competitions as you've been watching this entire talk. I just play a lot of them. Um, this is really good for kind of making people nostalgic in a sense when they watch it and uh, having these memories of a fantastic trip together with your friends. Maybe you even went to another country, you competed, it was hard. It was that kind of adds to that time of my life experience memory that you want to give people. Um, <clears throat> And um, music is part of it. Like if you can add music to a memory, it, the memory becomes stronger. Um, so I always try to make these highlight videos. I think they're fun. They're also good. They're fun to look back at. Even now when I'm recording this, I've, I'm smiling at all these great, great trips I had with my friends. Um, and it's kind of easy to do that these days. You just film a little bit and put that together. Uh, it's fun to have that on YouTube. Everybody loves to watch themselves compete. Um, and that is good motivation for everyone. One thing that I'll do a lot with competition trips or, uh, is that use the opportunity for when we are traveling together to a competition, use that opportunity to also do something social that's not competition related. Um, of course, I'll do this at home um, in between training and stuff. But um, when you're traveling together as a team, this is a great opportunity to do something. So I would always use... Um, competition trips and then plan something that's not competition related at all so as an example usually every year when we went to portugal um for the europeans we would plan like the last day before we went home we would do like a surf lesson or something everybody go together to the beach which is a really nice break from sitting in the sports hall for like four days um 
and um, or just do just do anything that is not related to to jiu jitsu. It could also just be to go out uh, at night after after the competition. But it's really nice to to plan something. We also did like uh, sort of guided Segway uh, sightseeing tours and stuff. And anything that's social for the team is uh, will give people a good good experience and a good memory of that trip. And um, <clears throat> a few more things. One is that people will get injured. Right? There's always someone getting injured, and it's really important for, for me as a coach to keep them involved. Yeah, so I will tell them, okay, I know you're injured, but at least show up for training and join the physical training, uh, join the social stuff that we do. I mean, if someone is injured, they're going to, of course, be invited if we go out to, to have dinner or whatever. Even often we'll train, and then we just go out to eat together afterwards, and of course, everybody's invited also if they're they're injured. you got to keep them involved. Don't don't lose those, those who get injured because everyone can get injured. And very important they have to or have to have to but when we go to competition trips they should join right? they should still go for uh, for coaching for more backup and just feel like they're still part of it even though they're sidelined for a while uh, very quickly when people get injured they can feel like oh okay now i'm out nobody's paying attention to me anymore and then they lose motivation for being part of it and it's very difficult for them co- to come back um so i want i don't want to let them feel like they're lost yeah? So it's, even joining the competition trips is, is is very cool, and and everyone else will be happy that they will join and they feel like they're being supported, even though they really didn't have to be there in a sense. And um, the final thing I will I will say is that at the end of the season, that's where I I keep all the belt promotions uh, until that. Um, and remember, we talked about people like to feel they're part of something special, and also that they can. Uh, accomplish something within that group and uh, here we create an entire environment for making them feel like they're part of something special that they go through hardship that they accomplish something and of course at the end of this you have the opportunity to give them um, kind of a symbol of this accomplishment which is a built promotion in jiu-jitsu and i will keep that for the final competition Um, so very often people will have uh, done a lot of competitions over the season they do that final competition, win or lose, I will usually always compete, uh, promote them at this point if they're ready, so to say. And uh, I will usually do that at like a team dinner after the competition or something where we're together in kind of a in an um, in, um, intimate setting, just us, um, and have a little speech and then talk about the whole thing and wrap up the entire season of, of the competition team. And I think that's just a wonderful way to, to kind of... Uh, yeah, as I say, wrap up the wrap up the the project, and um, then we go out and get really drunk usually, <laughs> and and so that's like the whole the full circle of creating uh, something that people feel like uh, that's larger than bigger than themselves that they can be part of, and then they can through hardship they can work uh, really hard they can grow within this, and uh, and they can achieve uh, some accomplishment there and get. Um, and they can get um, acknowledged for it, so to say. Um, and that's a that's a wonderful tool. And uh, to be able to build a project like that and and, um, and an entire kind of, what do you say, like from beginning to end over maybe, let's say, eight months, 10 months, one year, um, that is quite a fantastic tool when you, especially when you have an academy, to be able to give people that, give that to your members. Um, and I will say these people that I took through this for many, many seasons, I probably did this for... 10 years or more, 15 years maybe even, um, <clears throat> uh, more increasingly more organized like this. Um, I have just fantastic memories with these people and we uh, became really good friends. I, I still consider them some of my absolute best friends. We went through a lot of things together and um, some of them were kids when they started. Now they're grown-ups and they are still uh uh, absolute beasts on the mats and uh, most of them beat me today <laughs> and um, I'm really proud of it really really proud of this uh, that that I've been doing with with these uh, these people and also I mean proud of them for for going through all of it and uh, I feel honored that this is something that I could do with with people in my in my jiu-jitsu career as a side effect all of us got pretty damn good at jiu-jitsu um, and this was all levels, kids to adults, uh, white belt to black belt. Um, 
I'm not sure we ever won anything like really enormously big at black belt. Uh, we have one guy who won the Europeans at every belt level from, from blue to black, white. I, I don't think, I think they had white belts back then, uh, up until black belt. And, um, but I mean, even though we don't have any major titles from the world championships, like IBJJF worlds or Pan Ams or something like that, I've, I could not have asked for a more successful outcome um, because from a social aspect, from a human aspect, from a jiu-jitsu aspect, from a fitness aspect, uh, from a, a memory aspect, like a time of your life experience memory aspect, this has been 10 out of 10. And, um, and I can highly, highly recommend uh, doing that for yourself, for your students and for your uh, jiu-jitsu academy. So if uh, that was pretty much it, and if there's anything, uh, if you have any questions about this or um, anything, you can you feel free to contact me at any time. I'm pretty easy to find and reach, and I'll be happy to help out. I hope you enjoyed this uh, little video, and um, I'm going to leave it at that. Have a nice day.